Greetings in the name of the Lord. I'm Pastor Chris Driggs of Bolivia Baptist Church in Bolivia, North Carolina, and this is our first midweek Bible study for the uh, new year, 2021. Thank you for joining me. Uh, today we're going to start a study from the book of Nehemiah. Now, it's not going to be a study of the book of Nehemiah. It will be a, a large chunk of it, but what I want to do in this Bible study is I want to look at the man Nehemiah a little bit and talk about how he was a man of prayer. You know, there's never been a time, you know, we've talked about this throughout 2020, where the people of God needed to be on their knees, needed to be people of prayer, needed to understand that, that God is in control of all things, no matter what. Uh, whether they're good or bad from our viewpoint, they're all good from his viewpoint because they accomplish a purpose for him other than the evil in the world. And uh, that's not necessarily good from his viewpoint, but he can take that and even turn it to good for those that love him and are called according to his purposes. And so as we start this, we're going to uh, do in the entire chapter of, of chapter one, the entire first chapter of Nehemiah in this session. And then we'll do the second chapter and then we'll do portions of chapters of things and, and look where he prays and the results that he gets uh, throughout uh, the book of Nehemiah. Uh, the book was considered to be, by most, a part of the book of Ezra, really, that they were really kind of one, even though they were written at different times. Uh, many actually called it Second Ezra. Uh, it was thought to have been written some ten years after Ezra. Uh, but the books are closely tied to each other because Ezra and Nehemiah worked closely to build Jerusalem and reestablish worship there. Ezra uh, was a priest by lineage, and Nehemiah was governor of Jerusalem as he led the people in the rebuilding of the city wall, especially. Uh, this was a difficult time. The Babylonian exile had give away, given way to um, the rule and reign of the Persians. Uh, some of those in exile had already been allowed to return, but the work rebuilding and reestablishing a nation had not begun. Not really. It sort of had, but not in earnest. Uh, the Hebrew people still lacked somewhat of an identity, still felt isolated from God. But Ezra, he started a, a spiritual revival of sorts by concentrating on rebuilding the temple and establishing worship. Nehemiah focused on the physical rebuilding of the city wall, which was important because it symbolized how God had set them apart as a people, and it protected the temple and the worshipers of God. To God, they had never stopped being his people. But to them, they had felt cut off and even abandoned at times. That's, that's why they needed people like Ezra and Nehemiah, men of great faith, who understood God's covenant with his people and knew that God would never leave them totally abandoned. In fact, as we'll see in chapter 1, Nehemiah understood that they deserved God's judgment and they now needed God's mercy and compassion. So let's read chapter 1 together of the book of Nehemiah. Follow along in your own Bible, if you would. It's a lot of verses, so I'm not going to put them all on the screen, but if you'll just follow along in your Bible, that would be wonderful. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah. Now, it happened in the month Chislev in the 20th year, while I was in Susa, the capital, that's the capital of Persia, that Hanani, one of my brothers, and some men from Judah came. And I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped and had survived the captivity and about Jerusalem. They said to me, the remnant there in the province who survived the captivity are in great distress and reproach, and the wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are burned with fire. When I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days, and I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. I said, I beseech you, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who preserves the covenant and loving kindness for those who love him and keep his commandments. Let your ear now be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant, which I am praying before you now, day and night, on behalf of the sons of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the sons of Israel, which we have sinned against you. I and my father's house have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, nor the statutes, nor the ordinances which you commanded your servant Moses. Remember the word which you commanded your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though those of you who have been scattered are in the most remote part of the heavens, I will gather them from there and will bring them to the place where I have chosen to cause my name to dwell. They are your servants and your people whom you redeemed by your great power 
by your strong hand. O oh Lord, I beseech you, may your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and the prayer of your servants who delight to revere your name and make your servant successful today and grant him compassion before this man. Now, I was the cupbearer to the king, and that's the man he was talking about there at the last part of his prayer. Now, depending on your definition of prayer, uh, Nehemiah prayed anywhere from 9 to 14 times in 13 chapters of this book. Sometimes there were nothing more than a sentence prayer in a quick moment, but we see that Nehemiah was a man of prayer. Let me ask you this. When you are faced with confusing, stressful situations, who do you talk to about it? To be honest, who do you talk to about it? We often reason through a situation, consult with other people, and then pray about it. But Nehemiah went to God first. He prayed about a situation, even about other people involved in the situation. There's a song our choir sometimes sing uh, called Take It to the Lord in Prayer. That's what Nehemiah did. Uh, God was the first place to go for him, not the last. And here in chapter 1, we see Nehemiah praying specifically in response to distress. Now, maybe you're in some personal distress right now. We certainly are as a nation. I, I believe the church in the United States is in great distress. In fact, we look at our country and talk about all the distress we're in in our country. But let's look at the church. You know, a lot of people think, well, why do we have so many denominations and they can't all come together? Well, because it's a mess. Doctrinally, the church in the United States of America is all over the place. And many whole denominations have drifted away from the Word of God. Uh, we, we are in great distress as a church in the United States of America today. And nobody hardly wants to talk about it. We think because our church is okay, well then, then what, what's wrong with the rest of the country? Well, what's wrong with everybody else? But the truth be told, we all kind of have a part in this where we have brought ourselves to this point of distress because we kind of check in and out with God. We're not fully His. We, we're kind of partly His a lot of the time. And we don't fully invest ourselves in the study of God's Word. We kind of partially do it, maybe only on Sundays or when you watch a, a sermon or a Bible study like this. The church is in distress. Our country's in distress. Our world's in distress. And I bet you personally have gone through some distress in your life. And like the song says, the first place we should do is take it to the Lord in prayer. Because he is the solution to our distress. So verses 1 to 3, let's look at what happens here historically. Nehemiah is approached by people who had been left behind in Judah and others who had gone back to Jerusalem. So he takes the opportunity to find out how life is back in the homeland. Uh, now, in these verses, we're told that there is a remnant that has, that's in the province who survived the captivity. Uh, that's a fitting word because God had promised to leave a remnant so that the Hebrew people could continue on as God's children. As part of his covenant with them, he had promised that if they walked away from him and disobeyed him, didn't follow his commands, that he would allow the very thing they were going through to happen to them, distress, uh, exile, their enemies to run all over them. But he had always promised he would never forsake them as a people, that he would maintain a remnant set apart for himself and would one day reestablish them. And Nehemiah even pray, prays about that in his prayer uh, to to recall that, to 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 bring God's attention back to that and say, God, I'm claiming your promise, okay? So there's this remnant, and the report Nehemiah receives is that the people are there, but they're not safe because Jerusalem doesn't have its previous wall to keep them secure for the enemies of God. They're in distress. Things are not good there. That's something important to us, right? Security? If we were to examine our main motive for most of the choices we make in life, I think the desire to feel secure would be at or near the top of that list. It might even supplant love because we want to feel secure in our love and in our love relationships. For Nehemiah, he, he wanted to bring security to their relationship with God. The wall symbolized their need to get back to an uninterrupted relationship with God, a relationship that the enemy could not invade and nullify. So it needed a wall. It's a physical wall, but it represents a spiritual wall. 
that they needed to rebuild so that they became, or, or, or continued to be, I should say, the people of God without interruption, without distraction, without all the idolatry that got them in this mess to begin with. They needed to build this physical wall, but they also needed to build a spiritual wall. And that's what Ezra and Nehemiah were going to work on together. All right? Verse 4. When I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days, and I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. These words greatly distressed Nehemiah, that the, pit, that the city walls were, were destroyed, that the people were in great distress. He was hoping that things were progressing better because he wanted to see their relationship with God be reestablished. We'll talk about that more in his prayer in just a moment. So what does Nehemiah do? Well, he doesn't run straight to the king with his request to go home, which he'll give in verse in chapter 2. He doesn't send back a letter of encouragement. He certainly doesn't accept the news with the attitude that he can't do anything about it. After all, he's back in Persia. He knows who can change the situation. He knows who can do something about it. God. And so he literally cries out to God, refuses to eat, and prays continuously. How does he pray? What does he pray for? Well, the first thing we see in his prayer, which we're going to examine now, is that he prays for God to listen. He prays for God to listen. Look at verses 5 and 6 again. I beseech you, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who preserves the covenant and loving kindness for those who love him and keep his commandments, let your ear now be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant, which I am praying before you now, day and night, on behalf of the sons of Israel, your servants. Well, let's just stop there. Isn't this one of the reasons we should pray as well? We just want someone to listen to how we feel. Sometimes we just need to vent our frustrations, unleash our emotions, and we don't want anyone to judge us for it. And the only one who truly doesn't judge us for being honest is God. No matter their best intentions, I want to tell you, the closest human friend we have will still make judgments when we speak our heart. I'm not saying God doesn't do that in any way, but he listens to us. Let's us get it out of our system, and it's the only one who can accurately judge the situation and give direction that is always right. So how does Nehemiah get God to listen? Well, in the verse 5, he acknowledges that he knows who God is. He says he's the God of heaven, which makes him above all. Meaning, I'm not looking at anybody else. God, all those idolatrous, worshiping people of our past who worshiped all those other gods, they were not real. You're the God of heaven. You're above all things. He said he was great and awesome. There's none other worthy of his reverence, none other worthy of his prayer life. Nobody else he'd run to, because God, you are a the God of heaven, you are great and awesome. Then, then he talks about, he acknowledges that he is the God of the Hebrew people because he says, who preserves the covenant. That would be the covenant made all the way back in the Old Testament with Abraham to set them apart as a people, to always maintain them as a people. We already talked about it, to bless them when they were obedient, to curse them with their, with their enemies coming over them if they were disobedient but to always have that remnant and bring them back. That's the heart of, of the covenant. There's a lot more to it than that, but that's still the heart of it. So even though the people had broken the covenant God made with them, it's important to understand that God did not. Yeah, even, even their exile was a promise of the covenant intended to ensure their purity. This is God's way of cleaning them up and, in a, in a sense, rebooting like you do with a computer. He doesn't allow all of them to die, and I get that's hard to understand why God would allow any of them to die, but they were his people, and they were sinful people. But he kind of reboots his people a little bit here, renews them, restores them, brings them to a point where they understand their need for revival, which is what we need in the church today. As I talked about, the church is in great distress today. We ought to be praying and saying, God, you established us through the new covenant of the blood of Jesus Christ. We have forsaken you. We have forsaken your word. We need to be people on our knees, returning to your word, calling sin what it is, preaching the gospel message clearly, pre teaching it and, and proclaiming it in our personal lives, being people of prayer and Bible study in our homes, not just when we're in a church building. That we need to care about our neighbor rather than just caring about ourselves and trying to get through one day after another until you call us home. We, we need to repent of that. 
We need to remember that, that God established a covenant with us. We are his people. We have eternal security. However, we need to reveal who we are to this world, and we need to live and walk rightly with him. He preserved his covenant. He never disobeyed. Or he, never, he never forsook his covenant, but the Hebrew people did. And I believe we have today as a church as well. Uh, that includes me and, and most every Christian. We, we need to be gospel messengers, people of prayer, people of the word of God. Uh, otherwise, we're going to remain in this kind of distress and in a mess uh, as, as a people of God. He keeps talking about who God is. He says, and loving kindness for those who love him and keep his commandments. Uh, as part of the covenant, God's blessings were always available to those who kept a pure heart and obedient life before him. And Nehemiah reminded, Nehemiah reminded God that that's who he was so that as he repents, as he returns, as he tries to lead the people to return, God will come back with his loving kindness and begin to bless their efforts. All of these things the people had forgotten and forsaken, and that's why they had gone in exile. Nehemiah's words here are meant to be words leading up to repentance, words that reveal that Nehemiah knows how faithful God is and has been and what will be needed for them to be reestablished. In verse 6, then, Nehemiah asks God to notice him, to notice him. He says, let your ears be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant. In other words, uh, listen to what I'm saying and see the circumstance clearly. Have you ever felt like God isn't paying attention to you? Could it be that you haven't really been paying attention to him? That's why Nehemiah starts his prayer by acknowledging God and then asks God to acknowledge him. After addressing God and giving God the attention and glory he deserves, Nehemiah humbly asks God to listen and to look upon him and the situation. Before the exile, God's glory, remember this, before the exile, God's glory left the temple and return to heaven. That's when the exile was able to take place. When God removed his presence, all of Israel fell to her enemies. That happened because Israel stopped looking to God and trusting him alone. They stopped paying attention to God, and so God removed his known presence. Now Nehemiah puts his gaze upon God and wants to hear from God, but understands that he must humbly ask God to return his gaze and open his ears to prayer. God has every right to ignore Nehemiah. But because God is a merciful and compassionate God, a God who does not forget his promises, including restoration and redemption, he will look at Nehemiah and listen to his prayer. Nehemiah is asking God to return to him and pay attention to him. As Nehemiah returns to God, Nehemiah asks God to return to them. And Nehemiah tells God that he's a servant. And let your ear now be attentive to your, and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant. You know, Israel had become self-serving. So by saying, I'm your servant, Lord, this is a title of humility, a writing of their previous wrong attitude toward God. They'd been arrogant toward God and had not been submissive to him, that had not been humble before him, and had not been his servants. You know, I'm, I, many of you know I'm into sports. I, I enjoy watching uh, sports. And one of the things you see more and more in our culture, uh, from our culture today and in the world of sports are athletes that come out of college especially and get on these pro teams and they're full of arrogance because, after all, in college they were super, super, super good. The guys that make the NFL in football, for instance, who were playing in college are super good. The guys that make the NBA were super good. The guys that make Major League Baseball were super good in college. And so everybody was looking at them. They were the man. But then they get to the pros, and they're just one of many. And they have to assimilate to the game. And some are humbled. They humble themselves, and they go on to success. But those who are not, those who continue to walk in their arrogance and think they're the man, so to speak, usually end up out of their sport, or on the bench somewhere in obscurity. Why? Because they couldn't humble themselves and have a right attitude about their, their life, their, 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 their living, the, the living they wanted to make, and what they were about and what they were capable of. Uh, and, and their arrogance is their downfall. Humility before those in authority and around those who are your equal is a key to success in just about anything. 
That doesn't mean a person must lack confidence in who they are or what they can do. It just means they must be humble enough to take direction from those who have a higher knowledge and ability who have been placed in a higher position than they. In this situation, we're talking about God or God's people that are around you. Nehemiah dedicates himself to a submissive posture before God, first and foremost, which will then result in a submissive posture before one another as his people, but primarily we have to have a humble position before God. Now, so he, he's prayed for God to, to, to hear him, to pay attention uh, to him, to hear his prayer. The second thing he prays for is for God to restore. For God to restore, and he does this in different ways. First of all, he prays, he does it through confession. He does it through confession. Going back to verse 6, he says, um, uh, confessing the sins of the sons of Israel which you have sent which we have sinned against you. So the first thing he confesses is national sin. Not only does Nehemiah speak for himself, he speaks for the nation. He declares their willingness to serve the Lord again and confesses the sins of the nation. Now it's important to understand here that this does not reveal a pathway of confession and petition for the preservation of the United States. All right, don't take this that way. This is not a prayer for the nation as a political entity. It's a prayer for a people who are a spiritual entity created by God. The equivalent analogy today is the church. Nehemiah's confession of the sins of the nation is equal to our confession of the sins of the church today. The church is separate from the United States. Our sin affects the nation, but the nation itself, the United States, is no different than Babylon or Persia. Can we agree on that? That the United States is no different than the ungodly nations of the world. It's the church in the United States, and it's the church in all the other nations that are set apart unto the Lord. It's the kingdom of God throughout the world. All right, that's what that, that, that we're a part of. This is not our home. All right, the United States is not our home. The kingdom of God is our home, and that's what our sin, that's what our sin affects, and that's what we should be most concerned about. We are God's people within the nation, and God expects His people to live in humility and obedience. He knows the rest of the nation will not. So if we want to see the United States get on the right path. We don't pray for the United States so much. We do, but we don't. First, we pray for the church to get right. We confess the sins of the church to God and ask him to restore and revive us and humble ourselves to our God-given mission as messengers to our nation. Second Chronicles 7.14 says, And my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face. Then I will hear from heaven will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. Now, this verse is often misused by well-intentioned people. Let me give you the New Testament way of applying this verse and, and, and kind of quote it in a little bit different way and change it just a little bit. And I don't think I'm doing injustice to the Word of God, but this is what I think if we were going to use this verse today in the New Testament era under the New Covenant, not for Israel, but for the church, this is what we say. If my church, this is God speaking, which is called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, then I will hear from heaven, will forgive their sin, and will heal them and restore them. When we use this to pray for the United States, we accomplish nothing because the United States is not equivalent to God's people. It's the church from all nations that needs to repent and be revived, and that's what we should be praying for, just like Nehemiah does for God's people here. But then he leaves the national sin, which is really the, the people of God's sin, if you will, and gets to personal sin. He says in verse 6, I and my father's house have sinned. Even though Nehemiah was probably young and not really accountable prior to the exile, he takes responsibility and even throws his family under the proverbial bus, so to speak. He's confessing generational sin that has led to the exile of a generation. Listen, if we pray like we see, like we just saw in Second Chronicles, 
We cannot simply confess the sins of the church as a whole or point at the sins of others. We must acknowledge our own sin, or we will continue to be a part of the problem. God's people cannot be right with God if individual members of the body aren't willing to admit their shortcomings. Well, then Nehemiah gets in verse 7 into specific sin. Specific sin. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments nor the statutes nor the ordinances which you commanded your servant Moses. He confesses the corruption of the ways of God and how they had forsaken the commands of God as laid out in the Mosaic Law. It's really that simple. The first one, thou shalt have no other gods before me. They had blown it. They'd been worshiping idols. They had other gods before him. And so he's confessing that. Now Nehemiah then prays for God to restore, and he wants him to restore uh, through the covenant. Through the covenant. He says, remember the word, verse 8, which you commanded your servant Moses, saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. There's the cursing, what's called the diaspora. That's the spreading out due to disobedience, where the Hebrew people wind up all over in various nations. And we see that in the New Testament era, in the New Testament church, how they go from place to place, uh, taking the, the gospel of Jesus Christ and Paul especially would start in the synagogue because there was a synagogue there, even all the way up into Greece and into Rome and all of that, and, and, and all of those places, there were synagogues because the Jewish people had been spread out over the years so much. And even though they come back after the exile, they, they're still spread out. Not all of them come back, all right? Verse 9, but if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though those of you who have been scattered in the most remotest, remote part of the heavens, I will gather them for there, will bring them to the place where I have chosen to cause my name to dwell. This is the blessing, the regathering back to Israel, back to Jerusalem specifically, as a result of their repentance. Now, look at verse 10. They are your servants and your people whom you redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. Now, this adds a little reminder that points back to the Exodus and the redemption out of slavery in Egypt. They are your servants and your people whom you redeem by your great power and by your strong hand. That's subtle, but it is. He's pointing back to the time that he redeemed them before, and it's a reminder to God that he did it once. Can you please do it again? I'm praying to you, Lord God, to do this again. Like you delivered us out of Egypt, deliver us out of Persia, and bring us home. Now, the third thing about his prayer as we finish up, gets into verse 11, the very last verse of this chapter. He prays for God to grant him success. Very simple. I mean, he's, he's prayed and asked God to hear him. He's prayed and admitted how wrong they were and asked God to reestablish them. <clears throat> but there's going to be a process. Something has to take place. And so he says, O Lord, I beseech you, that means I pray, may your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and the prayer of your servants who delight to revere your name and make your servant successful today and grant him compassion before this man. Then he says, now was a cupbearer to the king, meaning the man he's talking about is the king. He has to go to the king, we're going to see that in chapter 2, to ask him for help to help solve the dilemma and the distress of the people back in Jerusalem. Nehemiah knew that prayer was the key to success because it opened the door for God to be the source of success. And that's true for you and I today, too. Uh, we need to open the door to success by praying to the one and only God who can bring us success no matter what we're going through. So Nehemiah is a man of prayer. And when faced with a distressing situation, he goes to God, establishes a connection with God, humbles himself before God, confesses his sin to God, and asks God to give him and his people a future with God. He puts their success for the future upon God and trusts him with it all. So maybe you're distressed by something. Maybe it's something personal. Maybe it's things going on with others who are close to you. Maybe it's the troubles we face in our nation or our world that's got you troubled. I encourage you to take it to the Lord in prayer. Cry out to him in your distress. Recognize that he is your first and best solution to the problem you face. Confess anything that stands in the way of God, working out his plan for you personally. Humble yourself before him and offer yourself to whatever service he desires. Then, determine to trust him, wait on him, and follow him when he moves.
as we go through our study of this man, Nehemiah, man of prayer, we're going to see that he prays over and over and over again in his situations, determined to trust the Lord. He waits on him consistently. And when God says move, Nehemiah moves. So I hope that'll be something that works out in your life, that prayer becomes more of a central part of your life. In fact, the very first thing that you engage in with God, even before you open his word, pray. Before you go to church, not just after you get there and you've sung a couple songs already, pray. Before you start that quiet time and any other aspect of it, just get quiet before the Lord and just begin to listen. That's a part of prayer too. So I hope that before this series is over, that we all become men and women of prayer, like Nehemiah was a man of prayer. All right, let's pray together now. Father, we come before you with thankful and grateful hearts for the salvation that we have in Jesus Christ. And we ask that you hear our prayers, that you take notice of us, because we are, as a church in the United States especially, we are a people in great distress. So many not following after your word. So many just kind of going to church but not being the church. So much sin that is in our personal lives that we sometimes justify and, well, we kind of declare that it's okay because everybody else is doing it. Lord, help us to hold to the truth of your word just as much as we hold to your promises that are in your word. God, may we see sin for what it is and confess it just as much as we look forward to heaven. May it be a part of who we are to acknowledge our sin and humble ourselves before you and to be your servants. Lord, the problems we have in our country are not because of sinful people. They're because of God's people who have failed to stand in the gap with prayer and with evangelism and devotion unto you. Lord, restore us that we might have that spiritual wall that protects us from the temptation, the sin of this world, but we might also have that mission that is God-given and see it very seriously to take your good news into all the world and to make disciples. So Lord, help us to not complain about how things are, but to allow you to transform us so that you can use us to transform how things are in our world. And we thank you and praise you that you hear us. You are a great and mighty God, and only you can make these kind of transformations. We acknowledge that and we trust that and we submit ourselves to that. And we pray it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, I hope that you enjoyed this first uh, installment of this series and this study that will be released every uh, midweek. Uh, thank you for joining me. Uh, coming up this Sunday, starting this Sunday, I'm going to begin a new series for the month of January called um, If Only I, dot, 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 If Only I, and we'll fill in and complete that sentence with different things. And this Sunday, it will be, If only I hadn't done blank. And we'll look at the past regrets and things that we may have in life that sometimes keep us from moving forward uh, with the Lord. Well, God bless you. Thanks for joining me. And I pray and hope that the rest of your week will be a wonderful week. <music>